Hello and welcome to the Voices for Nature podcast. My name is Jackie Mumford. And I'm Chris Gambian. Thanks for joining us. The need to rapidly reduce emissions has never been clearer. We know the biggest contribution to global emissions is energy generation from fossil fuels, and this should be the focus of efforts to halt climate change. Right now, the New South Wales government is changing the planning rules that determine environmental performance standards of all new buildings and developments in New South Wales. The design and place state environmental planning policy, or SEP, as we'll be referring to it, will set requirements across a range of factors that shape the built environment for millions of people. This will include energy efficiency, thermal comfort, rooftop solar, electrification, tree canopy cover, and green space. So quite wide reaching. Yeah, our guests today are, well, a very high powered, uh, impressive panel. Uh, Jeff Angel is the director of the Total Environment Centre and, and member group of the Nature Conservation Council. Jeff has been an environmental campaigner for over 35 years, working on a wide range of issues. This has including, included sustainability in the built environment, working to protect trees, green spaces and biodiversity in our cities, as well as improve building standards to reduce energy and water use. We're also joined by Emma Bacon. Emma is a passionate organiser, campaigner and activist. She founded Sweltering Cities in 2019. Sweltering Cities work with people affected by extreme heat to win more livable, sustainable and equitable cities. She's committed to building a broad movement for climate action. And Philip Oldfield is Head of School at University of New South Wales Built Environment, Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. His research interests are focused primarily on sustainable design, embodied carbon and tall building architecture. He's also a British Science Association Media Fellow and regularly writes articles for Architecture Australia's Architects Journal, The Guardian and many other publications. Philip is an expert in his field and we're very, very lucky to have him. Welcome to all of you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Uh, now, Jeff. Um, first question for you this evening. Um, you've watched development trends in Sydney and around the state for many decades. Um, it would be great just to hear some reflections on how you've seen um, that, you know, progressing and changes in the development space and where we are in terms of environmental performance in development. Well, Sydney, as we all know, it is an incredibly uh, economically vigorous and growing city. Population keeps increasing, urban sprawl keeps moving westwards. Uh, the densification of the city is, is on an upward trend. And over the decades, we've seen an inexorable decline in the environmental quality of Sydney. And one of the ways of looking at this is to consider its ecological footprint. <clears throat> And it wouldn't be a surprise to people that the ecological footprint, if you convert it into spatial terms, uh, takes up most of New South Wales. Now, that, that type of metric is something that we really do have to get a, con a control on. And at the moment in the planning system, <clears throat> we don't have sufficient controls to reduce the environmental impact of each new building we put in place, each new subdivision, each new big piece of infrastructure, particularly the big roads, uh, and even uh, uh, proposals to increase dam supply. So there are a whole lot of different things we can do that we are not doing. <clears throat> there have been a few improvements, and one in particular was after the Sydney 2000 Games, the Green Games, and a new planning uh, instrument called BASICS uh, uh, was put in place. And that means you have to reach certain benchmarks uh, for energy and water use uh, and renewable energy use uh, when you're building a new home or putting on a major addition. Hasn't been applied to the commercial sector and it should, uh, another big improvement I, I should recognise is the massive expenditure on public transport, somewhat neutered by the big new roads that have been smashing through the suburbs and uh, destroying thousands of trees. Uh, but for a long time, we needed big investment in public transport. And I think the final thing that <clears throat> we're seeing the green shoots from 
is a change in the energy supply uh, with more renewable energy coming through the power lines into your home. Uh, and as fossil fuel use declines, uh, hopefully that is rapidly accelerated with the new 2030 and net zero uh, uh, plans from the state government. <clears throat> so we're starting to know what needs to be done, but there's a lot more in order to make Sydney a far more environmentally city or a green city. Emma, I want to throw to you, uh, why do we need to think more today about urban heat than perhaps we have in the past? And what sort of prompted you to set up Sweltering Cities as a project? Thanks, Chris. Um, well, what prompted me to set up Sweltering Cities, and there's other people involved in the project, so I'll say what prompted us to set up Sweltering Cities was that we believe that we need to be doing more to address the impacts of extreme heat in our community. And part of that is, you know, looking at the existing impacts and understanding them, increasing awareness. And part of it saying that we need to urgently, you know, um, build our homes differently. We need to retrofit. We need to address urban heat because as the temperatures rise, it's going to have a really drastic impact on the community. At the core of a lot of what we do is trying to say that for a long time, heat has been felt as an individual problem. So those sleepless nights, the, you know, sweating as you walk down the street, struggling at work, um, feeling sick in the heat, things like that. People feel it as a really um, individual problem. But actually, it's a problem that, you know, we all face uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people feel at a time. So, you know, heat, extreme heat isn't an individual problem. It's a collective problem. And it's got collective solutions. We see some really... Um, like the people I speak to who live in Western, Southwest and Northwest Sydney are already facing really extreme impacts of climate change and of the living in the urban heat islands in our cities. You know, as I already mentioned, things like sleepless nights. You know, we did a huge community survey of 700 people across the city and 87% of people said that they had trouble sleeping on hot nights or, you know, um, or during heat waves. And we asked them what that felt like. And they said that the next day they felt unwell, dizzy, distracted, they couldn't concentrate, they were grumpy. You know, these are health impacts that people are feeling. And 87% of people who did the survey said that they're already facing them. We know that temperatures are getting much higher and much worse. And we need to do a whole lot more to increase awareness of those personal impacts to make sure people understand it's a collective problem with big collective solutions. And Philip, as an expert in sustainable buildings, how would you describe the status quo um, in terms of what we're seeing with environmental performance in the built environment? Um, and also just keen to hear what you think we need to be doing differently to get to this sort of net zero emissions or to help address some of these heat issues. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the status quo, well, where are we? Well, look, there's some exemplar buildings in Sydney and New South Wales. There's some great regulations are changing things. I, I'd, I'd point out neighbours as uh, one in the commercial building sector. And also, look, I think SEP 65 and the ADG have certainly improved the bottom level of residential apartments. But I think the entire industry recognises we need to do much more. I think there's two big challenges here. One is a shift towards whole life cycle thinking. So when we consider buildings and sustainability and environmental performance, historically, we've always focused on their operation lights, air conditioning, um, ventilation. We've always focused on, on reducing that and we've got pretty good at that. And we've always thought that that component would be 80% of a building's carbon footprint. We now know that's not true. And we now know as, we, as our buildings get more efficient and we add more layers onto them, we add more materials. Actually, you build a building today in New South Wales and its carbon footprint will probably be about half embodied so that's the materials uh, and the construction of the building and half operations. Now, that's a dramatic shift. And there's very few places in the world that have any legislation or regulations around embodied carbon. So a, a commercial building built today in, in Sydney may have operational emissions, if it's, say, six star or green star, of around 44 kilograms of CO2 per square metre. But to build that building would require 1,500 kilograms of CO2 per square metre. So equivalent to like 35 years 
of operating the building. And effectively, it's going to be much, much more because in 35 years time, hopefully we've decarbonized the grid and the operation emissions are zero. So we've really got to get a handle on that. And the whole world is facing this, not just New South Wales, not just Sydney, not just Australia. Very few places in the world have that. And the other thing I think, as Emma said, is heat. Now, look, Sydney is uh, really a climate, uh, a city of two climates. You've got the east and the west, and, uh, and there can be, you know, a difference of 10 degrees between the two. And we know an office building or, or any, any building in western Sydney may have double the energy demands of a building in eastern Sydney because of that excess heat. And we know these heat waves are getting worse. And that's not, it doesn't just bring with it a, a carbon implication. It brings with it a health and well-being implication, a morbidity implication, and, and that's only going to get worse. So what we've got to be very careful of is that we are using the right urban design, uh, the right architecture and the right technologies to mitigate this. Because if you build a building today, it's going to sit there for 50 to 100 years. We don't want to be knocking that building down when we get it wrong in 10 or 15 years time because of heat issues or because of comfort issues. So we've got to be getting it right today. Emma, I just want to throw to you on that question of heat. Um, what do we need to do um, for urban spaces to be more resilient to heat um, and healthier for the broader community? You know, how do we make sure we've got livable cities into the future? Thanks, Jess. Um, I want to firstly, I think, start by saying lots of the solutions aren't complex. You know, we have lots of the technology that we have lots of the, you know, thinking about it, we know that urban heat islands are created by treeless streets, by materials that absorb concrete, uh, sorry, materials like concrete that absorb heat and then radiate it back out at people, by lots of dark surfaces and roofs. We know that these things increase the temperatures. So we know that, you know, we can plant trees, we can change materials we build with, and we can have light roofs, which seems like a small thing that actually can have you know, a difference of 20 degrees to the touching, like on different roofs. Um, but I think then, you know, even though we might think some of the solutions are simple, what Philip just said, like it's a city of two climates, it's also a city of, you know, vastly different local planning. You know, I've been speaking to people in Fairfield. Um, we know Fairfield's faced a lot of, you know, recent struggles during the COVID epidemic, sorry, the COVID pandemic. You know, they've been under a lot of pressure and I've been talking to people in Fairfield for a while the last couple of years and especially one woman telling me that she's been watching the street trees um, in her street every cut, get cut down like the tops locked off them every three months and you know she started to go up to the contractors and say why are you doing this we need this for shade lots of people in Fairfield they don't have cars they're walking to the shops it's a huge issue and they say well the trees touch the electricity wires and so we need to cut them down for safety just saying that, you know, you go to some leafy, richer parts of the city, you know, and they've got the, um, they've got the electricity lines that can be touched by leaves, it can be safer, they've found solutions, but in places like Fairfield that already get incredibly hot, they're cutting down the tops of the trees every three months, even though we know that that is a solution to some of the urban heat problems in the area, you know, we need to actually understand what the human experience is of being in Fairfield, I think that's one of the places we need to start, we need to say, you know, where are people feeling the heat? How can we support them? And it's things as small as bus shelters, you know, to make public transport accessible and sustainable. New South Wales is going to electrify the bus network by 2030, but if it's too hot to stand at the bus stop, then people are still going to drive their cars. So we need to look at the simple solutions, but we also need to um, <clears throat> look at the you know, high level planning and say, you know, as Philip said, it's a city of two climates. There's all these different planning rules. This is why we need a statewide increase in the minimum standards, you know, through the set process um, in order to increase the standards everywhere. And actually, you know, we might not ever be able to make Fairfield like Double Bay, but we can certainly improve the situation in Fairfield. Mm, yeah, sounds like there's, you know, kind of some opportunities there, um, Emma, for change. And, and, you know, we do need to see change. Um, across the industry and, and there could potentially be a, a, an opportunity with the design in place set. Um, Jeff, just keen to hear how you would sort of describe the design in place set um, and whether it can be the vehicle to bring about the change that we need to see. Well, when you look at the planning system, <clears throat> it's basically a system that's pro-development. It's triggered by developers. They have lots of 
participation and appeal rights against decisions that, uh, that they don't like. But when you want a voice for the environment, whether it's to retain bushland, uh, to have more green space, uh, even uh, instead of having dark roofs, you have a light roof to reduce the temperature in the house, there aren't many advocates inside government. And the importance of the place and design set is that it is going to create more voices for the environment, uh, sustainability, and healthy living. Now, we fully expect uh, the development industry to follow its traditional line of saying, we need more houses. Uh, we don't need extra expense from all these environmental standards because uh, that, won't, that won't look good on the hip pocket and might affect the votes of the local Western Sydney politicians. So not only are we trying to uh, swing the planning system towards a better environment for present and future generations in Sydney and in fact, other urban areas of, of the state, uh, we're trying to mainstream good environmental outcomes from all types of development, whether it's residential housing, commercial development, industrial development, uh, new infrastructure, uh, to understand that those things are only part of the urban environment that affects a city and its inhabitants. And there's been an enormous amount of work done on the place and design set. I'll give credit to the department for doing an unbelievable amount of research. But we're about to get to the sharp point uh, where instead of all these good environmental outcomes being discretionary, they must be mandatory. They must apply across the board uh, so that we don't get nice boutique developments that look good with green credentials, but the vast majority of all the other development uh, continue, continues us along the path of environmental degradation. Phil, what's the opportunity as you see it um, from this new SEP? Um, what do you think the government needs to do? What's the leadership that we need right now? And uh, what do you think the sort of the key things we should be looking for from it? So look, in terms of the leadership, I, I think we need a kind of carrot and stick approach. Um, so we need minimum performance criteria um, fundamentally, but we also need to incentivize to go above um, that minimum performance and, um, and really create developments and example buildings that exceed and that can act as drivers. Um, so you see this with, with some Green Star buildings, for example, that are at the top of the market and, and help drag some of the market with them. An example as well is in, in Singapore, there's a piece of uh, legislation called LUSH, which is Landscape for Urban Spaces and High Rises. And that says, look, any you develop a site, you have got to return 100% to that site, green space to that site. But if you develop, if you provide more green space, green walls, green roofs, etc you can build higher so you're also incentivizing um excellent performance so for me another thing to i'd pull out about this design and place step is it sits at this nexus between performance and people so we know we need to get down to net zero um but let's not lose sight of why we build we build for people and to create great spaces and lifestyles and and, and communities for people and so there's no point in creating a net zero uh, building if the amenity is poor or if the people are dissatisfied with living there. Uh, and some decisions uh, may require more carbon, but create a better community. And what the SEP needs to do is to provide, you know, to navigate us through that complexity. To, to, you know, we need legislation to navigate us through balancing those kind of trade-offs and understanding the holistic complexity um, in development. Yeah, so important to keep people front of mind in all this stuff, hey? Um, good reminder. And um, 
Jeff, just keen to hear um, when we think the draft set will be released and what role community groups um, or people listening to us this evening, um, what role we can all play in making sure that we get strong environmental outcomes. Uh, the draft set <clears throat> will be out in November, probably late November. Uh, it was preceded by what's called an intended effects statement, which explained what they wanted to do with this set. Uh, that did raise alarm bells because it looked like a lot of the very important uh, environmental standards, whether it's tree planting, green space, net zero, even basics, would be discretionary. Now, the minister has appeared to move beyond that and understood uh, that this is not about the lowest common denominator. Uh, it's, as Philip said, uh, getting us to be not only meet good standards, uh, but to even go beyond. Uh, as I said, we fully expect the development and housing lobby to attack the proposals on the basis of cost and uh, the lack of housing. Uh, although I will note that uh, housing supply has very little impact on the ballooning cost of housing in Sydney. <clears throat> uh, after that, uh, they will have the consultation period into the new year. And it will be very important uh, that the community and environment groups are working very hard at the local council level, at the local MP level, and the ministerial level to counteract the lobbying from the developers. Uh, we all know what they're going to do. <clears throat> they're going to go to the Premier and say, this is dreadful for economic recovery after COVID. Uh, they're going to get front page stories on the Daily Telegraph uh, and try to develop an atmosphere uh, that is alien to getting this place and design set, the best one we want, uh, into law. So there's quite a lot of work to do, and uh, TEC and NCC are serving on a continued campaigning. What do you and think? Some some uh, protests, some rallies. We'll get some placards. What do we want? A fair design and place state environmental planning policy. When do we want it? Good start. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us, Jeff, Philip, and Emma. We really appreciate it. If people want to learn more about the design and place SEP and the submission process and how to get much more involved, please uh, head over to the Total Environment Centre website, which is what, Jeff? Ws.tec.org.au. Or Sweltering Cities. How do we find you, Emma? Yeah, you can go to www.swelteringcities.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, all those things. Um, we've done an open letter to um, which NCC and TEC have both signed, as well as academics from across the city, um, other organisations, community groups. It's been really great, um, great response. And so we're sending that to Perite Stokes and Ayers. Um, to ask to meet with them to talk a bit more detail about it. People can see the open letter on our website and they can sign a petition going to these ministers um, and the Premier to say that we'd like to see a lot more action on this, going into more detail um, and sharing some of the personal stories through that demonstrate why we need that sort of action. So swelteringcities.org is where you can find all of that. Fantastic. And as always, you can go to nature.org.au to learn more about the work we do here at the Nature Conservation Council. Thanks so much to our guests. Thanks, guys. Great to hear from you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Voices for Nature podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, head to our website, YouTube, or your favourite podcast player to find more. Of course, this and all the work we do for nature in New South Wales wouldn't be possible without your generous support. So if you can pitch in, please consider going to our website, nature.org.au, and hitting the donate button. As we like to say, koalas grow on trees, but money does not. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.